Good afternoon and welcome to our Shape Your Future session, which is part of the Careers in STEM webinar series brought to you by the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering, also known as ATSE. To begin with, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where I am joining you today. It's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people joining us today uh, for this session. So welcome. Uh, as we share and discuss our own knowledge and practices, we also re recognize the deep knowledge forever embedded in custodianship of country. My name is Ian Offerman. I'm a fellow of the ATSC, and I'm going to lead you through today's session. Very quick a bit about me. Uh, fellow of the ATSC, I'm an associate professor at the University of Technology in Sydney, but I'm also the chief data scientist for the New South Wales government. And I have been working in the area of data analytics and AI for many, many years now, more than I could actually possibly remember. The theme for today's session is from code to career towards your or towards our digital future. As part of the session, we'll explore the evolving digital landscape, emerging technologies and the diverse career paths available in our digital futures. As housekeeping, I'd like to remind all attendees that they have agreed to abide by the ATSC's code of conduct, including in the Q&A channel. This session will also be recorded, uh, which means that if you do say something bad in the, in the Q&A channel, it'll be captured forever and made available on the ATSC's YouTube channel in the coming weeks. So we're keen for this to be an interactive session, so please make sure to submit your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen at any point. We'll ask our presenter your question during the 20 minute discussion part and in the second part of the session. Now, our speakers. I'm excited now to say that we will be hearing from Julie King, who's the Senior Manager of Curriculum at the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority, also known as ACARA. Julie works with the Learning Area Curriculum and is a specialist on projects such as the development of work samples, resources, and professional learning. Uh, she was the project lead for digital technologies and curriculum specialist for technologies. Uh, Julie coordinated the development and review of the Foundation 10 Australian curriculum, curriculum in technologies. We're also joined by Dr. Ruangi Fernando, who is an accomplished IT expert. She's also founded two companies or two organizations, STEM Sisters and iSTEM Co, which advocate for women of color and facilitate employment opportunities for culturally and linguistically diverse women in STEM. And finally, Dr. Al Alina Lam, uh, who is a science, uh, science learning designer with Oxford University Press and an ambassador of ATSC's Industry Mentoring Network in STEM program, the IMNIS program. Alina's work includes developing print and digital education resources to support secondary students and teachers, and she does that nationwide as they navigate the science curriculum. So today, our panelists will explore their careers in STEM through the themes of the session. And we've asked them to reflect on their choices that led them to where they are, the influence of technology on their career pathway, and how the collaboration between creative problem solving and technology connect in their day-to-day -day work. So without further ado, I would like to invite Julie to begin. Julie, over to you. Thanks very much, Anne. I'll just share my screen. Um, and before that, I would like to acknowledge that I meet today on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to Gadigal elders, past and present, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia, and by extension, all of us. So my education, I've summarised there, and I'm going to speak to that in terms of the, the STEM journey that I've had. Um, but we have uh, the career highlights there, I suppose, the stages of my career with teaching um, in regional New South Wales and in inner West Sydney, then moving into distance education, writing and instructional design, uh, then working in technologies um, in the New South Wales Department of Education uh, as a senior project officer and then a manager uh, for technologies and then moving to ACARA where I was looking after the technologies, the development of the technologies curriculum, and now I, I manage um, the learning area specialists. So in terms of uh, my STEM journey, um, the Bachelor of Education was really the starting point. Uh, so that was for my um, food technology and textiles and design teaching. 
Um, but at that point, um, you know, it was a, quite a long time ago and uh, my interaction with computers was non-existent because there weren't any computers in schools. Um, so uh, that's quite a, a different um, notion for some of you to comprehend. Um, but my first course was um, in, in terms of computing was an introduction to microcomputers in which I did that by distance education and didn't touch a computer. Uh, so it wasn't until I actually moved to a, an inner city school and started to work on in-service learning things as I went along and trying to embed that in my teaching and learning. Uh, I also undertook a postgraduate diploma in design studies because that was a point in time when design and technologies became a subject of its own. And so I felt that I needed to extend my capabilities and in that there were many opportunities for me to develop my digital technology skills. Um, very early versions of the Adobe Illustrator to redesign um, the blade of a kitchen whiz. Um, all sorts of different interesting things that were completely outside my comfort zone, um, but were certainly very useful in terms of my teaching. Uh, my postgraduate diploma in design studies was really helpful in terms of broadening my expertise in technology so that um, I felt comfortable with a broad range of technology subjects, including industrial design. So I also looked at um, a diploma in book, book editing and publishing. So I completed that because that complemented what I was doing uh, with the writing and instructional design. And I was writing textbooks and, and uh, writing support materials for video. And then I worked with the New South Wales College of Nursing because that actually um, was uh, using my instructional skills, but then also um, extending them into tertiary education. As you can see with the colour coding, I've sort of then moved into the technologies unit and I was supporting all the technology subjects from foundation or kindergarten right through to year 12, um, doing a range of professional learning and curriculum activities. The digital education revolution funding came through, so I was out um, across the state um, providing training to schools about how to use the one-to-one -one computers that were being rolled out to their year nine students um, and how that would impact uh, teachers teaching and learning in relation to technologies. Uh, I was involved with digital stories, um, developing resources uh, relating to multicultural education and supporting the development of HSC online for technologies. I could then say that um, I was really interested in curriculum and uh, curriculum design. So I did a master's of education in curriculum uh, design and leadership. And uh, that it sort of coincided with the, the creation of ACARA and uh, the, the opportunity to be able to contribute to the development of an Australian curriculum for technologies in both design and technologies and digital technologies. So that was an, an interesting point for me um, in terms of uh, exploring what was going to be in a digital technologies curriculum, making a difference between ICT as a tool for teachers to use with their students, ICT as a capability, um, and then digital technologies as an actual curriculum. And so we um, focused on uh, computational thinking, design thinking and systems thinking, and really trying to draw that into uh, key concepts of what we were going to look at in the technologies curriculum. And then you can see that I had a number of projects that I was involved with, but probably the one that's been a really significant part of my career the last few years um, was managing the uh, digital technologies in focus project working with 160 disadvantaged schools across the country in remote, very remote and regional schools and some metro schools um, to help teachers to have the confidence to implement digital technologies. Uh, the last couple of years have been managing the review of the Australian curriculum technologies. And certainly now we're focusing in on collaborating with colleagues um, on how AI is represented through the Australian curriculum and providing some support resources um, to support that work. Thanks, Dan. Well, I've got to say that was fascinating. Thank you very much. From starting with with no computers, I mean, it doesn't get any more fundamental than that. So uh, <laughs> um, it, that's absolutely fascinating. I can't wait till we get to the Q and A session with your good self. Now, our next speaker. Let me get my notes back. Um, 
So uh, just a reminder to participants, if you have any questions for the speakers at this stage, please tell your teacher and put them in the chat. And uh, greetings to all those folks who are joining us from Alamanda College today. Great to have you on board. And I'd now like to invite Ruwangi to reflect on her journey. And Ruwangi, over to you. Hello, I hope you can hear me. Thank you so much uh, and uh, welcoming me and having me uh, this uh, part of the panel discussion. And I love to share my journey. It's all too kind of scattered so many things, but um, definitely I'll take you through. But I think in, in the core of the presentation, you can see how I've leveraged technology and that should be the main messaging. So um, I've arrived in Australia in 2017 for my PhD, that's in AI. But before that, I was an academic and I had my bachelor's and master's in uh, IT from University of Colombo and then from UK. So um, I've been in, involved in uh, technology space. I loved from this kind of the first computer that I ever kind of came, you know, in my vision. And I've been fascinated with what it can be done. And I really saw being a girl, um, the potential to kind of really leverage this as tool so that is what enthusiastic me to kind of start this journey and I really kind of went above and beyond with it. So for my PhD I looked at how planned special events because again IT is such a you know, very important and, um, you know, segment to all industries. So I looked at how planned special events affects road congestion. Uh, my PhD was supported by Data61 CSRO uh, which they were funded and we partnered with them on this project. But at the same time, so my university was Victoria University. And during my PhD, also I, uh, you know, worked with the Department of Transport because I really wanted to engage with the industry of transportation and really see how that come together. But my journey is pretty little unique. So apart from being really core STEM journey, I also had an entrepreneurship journey in a way of a more um, passion driven project. So the same year I started my PhD, I started a non-for-profit called STEM Sisters, um, again, because we uh, couldn't see much attention on the intersectionality aspect of gender diversity in STEM sector in Australia. And there is a larger portion of uh, women who uh, identify as women of color who are not provided targeted support. So that journey also can currently kind of move alongside with my, uh, you know, core STEM journey and being an IT person, it really helped because I'm the one who developed the websites. I'm the one who created all the digital kind of infrastructure for the companies to grow, right? And to get that into that attention. Um, similarly, during my PhD, I kind of worked on uh, many other aspects. I was teaching, I was presenting at conferences where all that was part of AI and technology. And I completed my PhD in 2021. But one thing that I really felt very important uh, with my gender diversity sort of an advocacy journey, there is more needed to be done in this space. So I really need to dedicate more time. So I was doing my passion project alongside the PhD. So now I wanted to utilize my full energy over there. So alongside with STEM Sisters, I started another company with a co-founder, Dr. Molly Muse in iSTEM Co, because employment is one of the key things what we need to address. Again, we have a technological solutions there right so that's where a platform called there which we are launching this year it's like very similar to seek and indeed but for women in STEM. So STEM Sisters is supporting women of color in STEM, but I STEM Co and there is for all STEM women. Uh, and it's a place where we have used technology to remove the biased elements, like your name, your age, the country that you are either born from, your previous studies, or anything factors that would, you know, would take you the bias that comes in and that lets you like you know stop you in your journey or make make a hurdle we have removed that from the recruitment process so uh, there is quite a lot that i do again my technology background i'm the key developer behind there as well so um this is all that i do but because i've kind of paused a bit um, my AI like direct involvement. I work as a consultant. Uh, I'm also one of the um, DNI uh, chair for Victorian uh, Australian Computer Society. Uh, with that, I provide consultation also for the tech sector and also for the AI sector. 
So it's kind of a very scattered story, having a lot of components in, uh, because I, I love uh, the power of technology and I really believe um, technology is a way that we can see it's like a sword where you have both ends being sharp but I think we can definitely use it for good so that's what I like to leverage in technology and I encourage you all also to use technology any sort of a passion or a career journey to enhance it yes thank you you very much for Wangi. I mean, it, it shows the richness of your experience, all the different areas that you've touched and all the different organizations you've worked with. It, it really shows just what STEM can open up in terms of career pathways. And clearly got, got quite a long way to go yet. So we're really excited to see the next phases in your career. To conclude the speaking session, we have Alina here to talk about her experiences. So Alina, over to you. Thank you, Ian. Um... Sorry, yep, perfect. Right, I'll just share my screen. Um, yeah, so my name is Elena and I'm joining you from uh, Wurundjeri country today. Um, unlike Julianne Rowangi, I don't have a background in IT or digital technology and um, I'm very early into my career. So I can just remember when our first classroom uh, well, when when we got our first classroom smart boards, and I think that was this was when I was in grade five or so, um, but teachers were still learning to use them, and I didn't really have much engagement with them either. Um, as a learner throughout my high school years, I experienced that gradual integration of technology into the delivery of education. Um, we had access to computer labs for the basics, and in year ten, the school had enough funding to lend each student a netbook. Um, which is a tiny little laptop. Uh, in fact, the screen was so small that we couldn't really do anything useful on them. So not many of us actually use them. Um, everything was still very paper-based and for students who brought their own devices in, all we really used them for was to look at PDF pages of our textbooks. So honestly, I still can't, um, I can't remember um, seeing a teacher bring a laptop into class. So I'd like to encourage you to have a think about um, comparing that to your experiences in the classroom today. And um, hopefully that helps you appreciate how much technology has become integrated into your learning experiences, how quickly this has changed over the last 10 years and how quickly our relationship with technology will continue to evolve as we move towards the future. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, my career journey is quite short compared to Julie's and Ruangi's, but let me walk you through it and help you see how techs played a role in each of these stages and how I've um, had to adapt. So starting with when I was in high school, um, I took a lot of art subjects when we we're allowed to pick electives, um, everything from viscom, visual arts, computer arts. At that stage, it was very Photoshop and InDesign based. Um, when I hit year 11, that really changed and I found myself drawn to the sciences. Um, I'm based in Melbourne, so I took VCE chemistry, biology, maths methods, specialist maths, English, of course, and health and human development. Um, so it was very much geared towards a career in the health sciences or life sciences, anything STEM really. Um, and then if we fast forward past all of the internal assessments and final exams, um, I found myself enrolled in uh, the Bachelor of Pharmaceutical Science at Monash University. Um, I majored in something called formulation science, um, which means I learned a lot about the science behind anything that's a combination of chemicals. Uh, so a formulation, that's medicines, perfumes, cosmetics, paints, soaps and detergents, and even food products. And I found it really fascinating that um, with the same fundamental scientific knowledge, um, I could apply this knowledge in a range of different contexts. Um, so with that, I really encourage you to consider how your own scientific interests might fit into a broader context. Um, in terms of tech usage, this is where we started having to re rely on our Googling skills and um, our critical thinking skills to find information and evaluate the information we did find. Like, is it reliable? Are they presenting information that's biased? Um, there were some subjects where we had to use specific programs to complete calculations, generate graphs, analyze and interpret data. 
uh, but most of our assessments were very paper-based so like exams we had to submit reports that were written up in Microsoft Word but at the end of the day I guess limited in terms of how much tech was integrated there uh, up until my third year of university where we were expected to present our work in more innovative ways uh, submissions were more interactive and we were designing things like flowcharts, concept maps, interactive um, Excel spreadsheet templates to demonstrate our learning in a way that was more user friendly. So that really made us consider our digital communication skills. Um, I did just want to mention that I tutored primary and secondary students in math and English casually throughout my university years and that feeds into where I am today as well. All right, um, so then I went on to do a PhD. Uh, my research looked at how we could improve the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. For those who don't know, RA is an autoimmune disease where your body's immune system attacks its own cells, particularly the cells in your joints. Um, current treatments are immunotherapies that can be really nasty in terms of the side effects they cause, because they weaken your immune system. So people get really bad infections when they're using these medications. But um, there's some really exciting research that tells us the lymph nodes, like those uh, lumps that your, your doctor feels for when you have a cold, um, those exist near your, your joints as well. And when your joints are swollen, these lymph nodes are very active and they're the sites for all your trouble troublemaking immune cells. So my work investigated how we could take advantage of the system that connects all these lymph nodes to treat RA in a better way. So I was doing a lot of lab work with biological samples, but at the end of the day, everything was analyzed using computers. You'd um, use specific instruments or devices to measure um, fluorescence in your samples, radioactivity, uh, the files you get from scanning like a lymph node, to get a 3D image, those files were humongous and you'd need to learn how to use a program to analyze that and get some useful qualitative or numerical data out of it. So it was constantly needing to learn how these technologies work so that I could make decisions about how to apply them in my research and strengthen the scientific story that I wanted to tell. Uh, I mentioned story because somewhere along the way, after presenting at multiple conferences and meetings and reading lots of research papers, I gained a really strong interest in the storytelling of science, in science communication, and that contributed to the path um, to where I am today. Uh, so as Ian mentioned in his introduction, um, I'm a learning designer at Oxford University Press where I get to apply my scientific knowledge and critical and creative thinking skills to create these learning resources for you and your teachers as you make your, your way through um, the science curriculum. Uh, we as publishers need to stay on top of curriculum change, which reflects the changing needs of society um, so that your generation and those of the future are well equipped to succeed. This requires us constantly needing to learn about new technologies, update our ways of doing things, including everything from the programs that we use day to day, but also in the products themselves. Um, they need to meet the mark in terms of what's current, but also play to the strength of the more traditional approaches. Um, yes, I've skipped a bit on my animation, but yes, uh, the final thing I wanted to share was that through my involvement with Atsi, um, I'm able to keep up to date with where tech is currently and what direction it's moving in, which helps me in my job to make sure we're providing enough support to help students learn the skills they need to excel in their careers, um, especially when it's becoming more and more heavily focused on digital. Uh, by the end of this session, you should be able to appreciate that um, tech has changed the way we learn, the way we do science, and really just the way we live our lives. And I know I've still got a long, long, long way to go, a lot to learn, um, but I'm really excited um, to be part of the discussion today. Wonderful, thank you very much, Alina. Again, a fascinating journey from, from, from doing arts-based subjects to doing science, technology, engineering, and maths. 
We do have a couple of questions in the chat, but I wanted to ask one question for all of you before we get going. Science, technology, engineering, maths could seem like very individual careers where you operate as a solo operator. I'd just like to get your very quick reflections just to get us started. Uh, and, and Alina, I'll start with you. We'll go back in reverse order of speaking. Your perspective on the role of, of teamwork uh, in order to deliver results in a science, technology, engineering world. And the um, then Julia might get specific to you and talk about curriculum, but I just want to ask you your thoughts about collaboration and teamwork in, in doing STEM type work. Mm, yes, uh, teamwork is an enormous part of every aspect of my career so far from when I was doing research, everything is about collaboration, everyone brings different skills so in to be able to harness everyone's strengths bring everyone together and do better than you would have been able to do just as a, an individual I think that's a really big part of creating good science um, and like achieving success there. Um, and in terms of my job today, um, as a learning designer, you sort of sit in the middle of the company. So you're talking to all different departments, editorial, you talk to people in production, people in finance, just, it really requires all hands on deck to make the ship float and arrive at the destination you want to go in. So it just it's really important, like being able to work together with other people, bring together everyone's strengths um, to make things possible. Thank you. Rwanda, I'm going to add, add a little twist to the same question for you. Uh, science, technology, engineering, maths, STEM. We often talk of, often hear about STEAM where there's an A in there as well. And from your own perspective, you're not the lonely scientist with a lab coat in the lab. You're not the, the lonely programmer sitting there programming. What role collaboration and what role collaboration not only across the STEM part but also the STEAM part yeah <clears throat> of course it's just uh, the way the world is moving we have we need everyone and as inclusive as uh, you know technology is supporting other or the segments like you know technology needs that input as well if I give you a little glimpse I remember when I was doing my PhD thesis I was looking at looking the AI solution, like because I was looking at transportation, but I could apply, I could see the similar solution apply on medical domain. And I was actually reach out to some of those researchers because there is that sort of a synergy, you know. So collaboration and partnership is so important. And again, in artistic side, again, if I give you an um, example from STEM Sisters, we have range of initiative. One is a, a magazine, it's an award-winning magazine called Magnify. We are doing that to support support, amplify the voices of women of color in STEM. And it's a group of like, we are using all artistic tools. We are using Canva, which is technology enabled, you know, design tool. And then all of those, even like, you know, bringing that art sensey to, to the science and learning from, uh, you know, learning from nature, like every aspect is so important. And the other thing is like, you know, the diversity, when we bring like, you know, core diversity is like, you know, where like the, you know, what we born with, but apart from that thought of diversity, you know, the th different thoughts, those that is very critically essential for any organization, any business, and especially for STEM, because STEM is driven by innovation. And if you want to innovate, you need people with different thoughts and ideas. That's number one key thing. And, and to face the challenges of currently what we have and what we see in the future, we need everyone to be part of this journey, come collect Collectively, uh, you know, STEM is not going to be like, you know, in the in the 2025, 90% of job will require STEM skills. So STEM is not necessarily a segment of employment. It's it's the employment. So therefore, learning STEM is essential. Being part of STEM is essential. But it doesn't say you don't have to be a hard code wired coder. That's it's not just STEM. You know, there is so much opportunities. Yeah. Right. And that leads nicely, Julie, onto your, yourself. Uh, it's everywhere. It's part of every career. Uh, how on earth do you pack it into a curriculum, in particular when you try and include that collaboration and teamwork element in the technology curriculum? How, how do you do that and how do you develop these skills in students? So I think there's sort of three levels, really. I mean, when we're actually developing the curriculum, we're working together as the science, the technologies and the mathematics specialists working collaboratively to actually develop um, a curriculum that 
actually speaks to each other. So we're looking for the related content across those three learning areas um, and making sure that the progression is actually appropriate, um, that we're not teaching things in science before they've learnt something in maths that they might actually use. Um, so there's that side of the collaboration as well. Um, and from a curriculum perspective, we're looking at um, to get the, the E, um, which is sometimes sort of forgotten because it doesn't have its own learning area. But engineering is addressed through physical sciences um, and it's also addressed in design and technologies through the engineering principles and systems. Um, so there's a very explicit place for engineering in the Australian curriculum. Uh, in terms of when we work with schools, um, we really want to make sure that we have people from executive as well as science, technologies and maths teachers, um, because often to create a really rich STEM uh, unit of work and to get students working collaboratively across their science and technologies and maths classes, we need help from executive to be able to look at the timetabling decisions that might actually facilitate that. Um, and whether or not that's the establishment of a new um, elective or it's just to make sure that people are on the same line so that can happen. So there's collaboration in that way as well. And then once you get into the actual development of a unit of work and a STEM project, then the students need to be using their teamwork um, for that. The other aspect of curriculum is that we have general capabilities and we have seven general capabilities. We've got numeracy as one, um, digital literacy, critical and creative thinking, personal and social capability, um, ethical understanding, intercultural understanding, literacy. So all of those things work together when you're actually working in a STEM project. That sounds like a lot. So I really do not envy you, but uh, I think the, the packaging up from the more coherent picture, I think is, I think it's the only, only opportunity you've got to try and bring everything together. Now we've got some online questions we're going to turn to, so I do encourage you to keep the online questions coming. This one is directed, uh, Alina, at yourself, but I'm going to ask the same question of each of you. Uh, Alina, how did you know you wanted to pick formulation science at university? How on earth did you know that? Aha, uh -huh, but I didn't know that. <laughs> um, starting off in uni, I really didn't know what direction I wanted to take. Um, as part of my degree, they give you three options. You can go down the biology route, the chemistry route, or the, I guess, formulation science is also very chemistry, but it's different from like uh, synthesizing molecules, like uh, making new molecules. It's more about like the interactions between them further down the track. Um, I, throughout my degree, I went through that whole thinking process, like, I want to do biology. No, I don't want to do biology anymore. Oh, let me do uh, synthetic uh, chemistry. No, I don't want to do that anymore. So I definitely um, had my interests, I guess, peak and trough um, with each of these different majors. Um, at the end of the day, what drove me to formulation science was, mm, I really liked the idea of um, like being able to apply my skills more broadly I guess and for me formulation science um, you can apply your scientific understanding very easily across different products so I guess there's more opportunity for you to uh, be involved in different industries there um, I didn't see this as much with biology and the straight chemistry um, I feel like those in a traditional sense, gear you more towards research. Uh, so I guess I wanted something that was more to get me out into the world, uh, which didn't really end up happening anyway, because I went and did a PhD that was very research heavy. Um, but yeah, I think just keeping open to different um, opportunities, having a think um, beyond to like what jobs you want to, you might see yourself doing helps you make that decision. But at the end of the day, like um, the panel here has had such a broad um, range of experiences throughout their career. And um, I think even though you need to make a decision after you finish high school about what you want to study, don't let that be the be or, or end all. There's so many opportunities for you to explore other things, make a career change, apply the same skills in a different context. It's all very transferable. So um, as long as you're nailing those fundamental skills, like all the um, capabilities that Julie talked about just earlier, 
um, I think that would set you up really well for whatever you choose. And I'm going to take that as a tag to you, Julie. Uh, your career has been remarkably diverse. I think the only thing you were missing was astronaut out of your list of experiences. Uh, so what advice, I mean, how did you know the first step after school? How did you know that was the right step? And then generally, what advice have you got to people? Given the diverse career you've had, what advice do you have to give to people who at some point need to take that first step and then other steps? Uh, look, I think, you know, just follow your passions, really. Um, I know when I was at high school, um, my teachers were not overly impressed that I was doing food um, and uh, home economics type subjects. They they couldn't understand that. But I was really interested in food. I was particularly interested in nutrition. Um, to, do, to do food and technology, uh, textiles, I had to do textiles. It wasn't my kind of go-to place, but I ended up getting a passion for that as well. Um, and then I think just kind of looking towards the future, like, you know, just being aware of what's happening around to see, oh, look, there's this new thing kind of design and technologies. I feel like I'm not going to be, you know, really well set up for that. I need some more information. I need to do a bit more research. And that was a brilliant course to do and really helped me with the digital side of things. So I think just kind of being aware of what the next thing is and, and how you might prepare yourself in some way I, you know, I'm certainly not a guru on any of those things, but I know enough to be able to sort of take people on a journey of and find the right people to help me to actually get to the next step with uh, with the work that we're doing. Um, so, you know, certainly from this uh, conversation, you know, I've found that there's a couple of new people around AI that I didn't know about. And uh, so, you know, there's all things to keep your ear out as, as well as you're sort of working on any of the projects that you're working on. I'm sure we're going to touch on AI in a way, but Julie, just staying with you for a moment, a, a really endearing question. Do you miss teaching and school as a former teacher? Um, look, I, I do in, in many ways, but I do so much work with schools in different ways. And um, certainly the project where we were working across the country in a broad range of schools, I was going out to schools and working with teachers. And I, I don't teach students, but I often and teaching if, or providing professional learning for teachers and that's still a same connection I kind of do that kind of mentoring in my role as a, a manager of learning area specialists as well so I'm kind of providing advice and so forth um, but yesterday I happened to be um, at a, an event the Jesse Street National Women's Library lunch and I was seated on the table with students. So, you know, I was sitting next to the four year 10 students and asking them what you know, subjects they were going to do in year 11 and year 12. And it was just great to, you know, to hear how they were selecting their subjects to really plan for the future of the areas that they were interested in. So, yeah, I mean, that was fun. And a shout out to the teachers joining us today. Uh, Rwangi, I'm just going to ask you the same question about how do you know and what advice could you give? And then there's a, there's a second question specifically targeted at you. So, so how do you know that, that this is the next step, given all the steps you've taken? And what advice could you give people? Yeah, so I can definitely echo what Julia and Alina said, you know, that's that's been been my way of journey, like, of course, passion, but sometimes you're finding hard to find what's our passion. So then say yes to everything is the way to start, you know, because then you experiment with yourself, you know, figuring out is this something that I like or do, is this something that I don't know? There are clear, clear things that you know, like, you know, of course, I'll my love for IT, like, you know, technology, anything that IT have framed and come to now AI has been my passion. Passion. But then again, with, with the other steps, you know, with the other entrepreneur steps that I've taken, that it's been trial and error, and then, then have found my path. Now I'm actually trying to see how technology and diversity, how they can connect, benefit each other, and really make a strong bond. So that's my kind of, you know, portion, like, you know, my mission ahead. But it's, it's all about trial and error. And I would say, like, everything that I've taken, even I think if I, if I consider all oh, this was not worthwhile, they have connected, like, you can only connect dots looking backwards. So I would say all the dots have connected so far for me, even the smallest designing thing that I've taken, I love creativity, but I can't draw much, you know, but I have conceptual ideas of creativity. So like tools like Canva have enabled me to bring that up because because, you know, 
that takes the burden of the skills that I don't have, you know. Likewise, anything that I've done so far in my life, I can see how they connect to each other. Even now, if I'm now not, like, you know, I've been an academic all my life, you know, in universities. Now I'm taking an entrepreneurship journey. But my teaching and learning and then being part of that, and like, you know, having even doing a PhD, you know, you are, you don't require a PhD to be a tech, con like, you know, tech entrepreneur, you know, but still having that PhD really leverage a lot of, so everything that I've done, it has been connecting the dots, you know, so it's just have to say, yes, you are, you are young students, explore, explore what's out there and don't make any excuses in terms of knowledge. You have every piece of knowledge that in the heart, like, you know, basically Pam, but like in and you're at your fingertips so you can learn about anything enrich yourself about anything explore anything so use those opportunities when you're young experiment that's what i say so you can find your passion sooner and you can move 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 towards that passion more aggressively now my friend we're running out of time we've got a whole lot of questions which have popped up so i wonder if the panel will indulge me with some rapid fire responses see how many of these we can get through uh, Ruanga, the first one's to you, please, rapid, rapid fire. Uh, do you think being a woman, it's being, it's unusual to choose coding as a career? And are there many women in IT? Short, short answers, please. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I don't consider like, you know, gender for, for like, and I've taken that equation out from my mind. So therefore I'll, I'll find women in STEM, like, you know, women in coding. So, but there is less, we need to improve that and we need our hands on deck so that we would remove the bias from AI. Yes. Awesome. Excellent. Alina, uh, what was your ATAR to get into university, if you're willing to share it? Happy to. Um, I got a 93.5. Um, I think I needed an 86 or something to get into my degree. <laughs> okay. And for everyone listening, that is awesome. That is a very <laughs> good ATAR. Uh, uh, there's a really big question here, which I'm going to skip, and so I want to have that as our closing question. Rawangi, is it hard to know how to hire someone without knowing their background? And again, really, really... Short answer to a very complex question. Yeah. So what you have to look for if you're hiring someone, their skills and experience. The rest of the any other information should be relevant. So if they have the skills, if they have the experience, and more than anything, what is really a good team player or good employee is, is when you talk to them, you will find. But if you have the basic skills to get to an interview, it should be the qualification and the skills. If you see that in any anyone, what age, what gender, what, uh, you know, country of birth or any, any language that they speak should be relevant. Yes. Awesome. Uh, Julie, this is like mastermind, mastermind. Julie, have you ever had second thoughts about changing your career? And if, if you had to change, what do you do? And I'm sorry, it's a really complex question. <laughs> Give a short answer. Um, uh, no, I don't have any regrets about the, the changing of direction. As, as much as anything, I went into instructional design because um there was an opportunity and it seemed interesting and I thought I would uh, have a go at it um and it worked really well when I had my daughter so that was a more flexible career at that point in time so um that worked well for me at that point um and yeah the decisions I've made I'm I'm happy with um in terms of uh, the next steps that have kind of evolved from there but definitely stepping up and doing things that are outside my comfort zone and just being prepared, um, put in, in a bit of a, you know, an effort to kind of um, understand what you need to do next um, and, and do some courses along the way, project management courses, policy courses, short things um, that give you an extra set of skills, really helpful. And the last one from this list before we do some, some wrap up questions, do you need to have specialist maths to be a coding expert? I'm gonna throw that to anyone. No, because now it's further easy because, you know, like coding is more, there's not just a single opportunity where you need to start with a scratch. So there is so many entry points. So no, but love to right. have mathematics knowledge is excellent, but yes, not a requirement. Okay. And we're going to go now in reverse order of speaking, please. What's the most exciting technology area that you're looking at at the moment and you think will make an impact in the future? And I'm sorry to, again, to ask you to be short, uh, Alina, please. Most exciting Ooh. technology area. Oh, that's really hard. Everything's very exciting to me. <laughs> oh, you really put me on the spot. 
come back to you if you like. Yes, I'll give you a moment, I'll give you a CPU cycle. Uh, Rewangi, most exciting technology that you're looking forward to seeing have an impact in the future. Yes, AI and quantum technology. AI has its overbound limits and with the quantum technology coming in gives the, the power that is needed. So you would see revolutionary technology coming in the near future. So that's the place to be. Awesome. AI is really looking pretty awesome. Julie? Uh, yeah, it's certainly what we're looking at at the moment. Uh, it was something that we looked at in terms of the, the review of the curriculum. Um, and now we're just fine tuning, exploring how it is evident in the curriculum as it exists um, and how we can support teachers to understand that related content between mathematics and digital technologies in particular, but applying it across all learning areas. Um, and it's an interesting space for us. Awesome. All right, uh, Alina, back to you. <laughs> Let me just echo that about AI. Um, AI is also transforming how we operate in education publishing. So it will be really interesting to see um, how we can sort of harness it and uh, use it moving forward. Wonderful. Well, I want to say thank you to our speakers. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Thank you very much much to Julie Rwangi and Alina for sharing your career journeys with us today and for answering all of those excellent questions. I'm sorry we didn't get through all of those questions. They were a little slow to start, but then they came flooding in. Thank you all of those who've joined in the classroom today. We hope you have something to take away from this session that has left you with a bigger picture on the importance of learning in a technology-powered, human-driven future. And there are more Shape Your Future sessions running this year. So please consider joining us again to hear more exciting conversations about spectacular STEM professionals like we had join us today. We'll also send you a short feedback survey following the session along with a worksheet so you can explore the ideas from the session today. Thank you very much for joining us. I've been Ian Opperman, New South Wales Chief Data Scientist and ATSC Fellow. Thanks for joining today. Thank you.